Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. We are going to uh, finish the last verse that I should have done last week and ran out of time. If you'll notice in your Bibles, I was looking at Bart's when he read... Uh, Verse 1 of chapter 7 really should go with chapter 6. Does your Bible write it that way? Many modern ones do. Because it seems to conclude the uh, discussion of chapter 6. And there really are some very interesting things here. It reminds me when we look at it, so since we have such promises as these, well, that's obviously referring to what's gone before, those tremendous promises of God. And I want to tell you what. The bottom line is, aren't you glad that God has made us some promises and He's going to stick to them? Woo, it don't get any better than that, do it? And the neat thing is to learn the promises that you already got. For the more you understand who you are in Jesus Christ, the greater the Christian life is. Someone said the, the greatest preaching of the Bible is sharing with Christians what they already are in Jesus Christ and what they already have. That's really true. Notice it calls them dearly beloved. This is such a beautiful word when you realize this is what God the Father said to God the Son at his baptism when he spoke out of the cloud and the dove came and at the transfiguration when he spoke out of the cloud again. Now that great title of love and certainty has been transferred to the people of God. Isn't that exciting? That says something of who we are in Jesus Christ. It almost makes me nervous to think about it, but we are brothers and sisters with Jesus Christ. Isn't that, doesn't that startle you just to think about it? Called by his same name. Paul mentions this name several times in his uh, epistles, and they're listed in your outline there. Notice it says there are two aspects of this that I think are very important. Quite often, we, we could preach an, a very biblical message on that salvation and sanctification and the Christian life is all of God. They are gifts given to us because we're His children. But there are other passages that tell us that we must equally participate. We must participate in receiving Christ. We must participate in the living of the Christian life. And this one verse has two phrases that encourage our participation. Look at the first one. Let us cleanse ourselves. Aorist tense. Let us once and for all cleanse ourselves from everything that defiles. And the last part, mine has a little different than yours. In the reverence to God, carry on our consecration to completeness. Now, I believe King James has perfecting holiness. It's a present participle. Now, notice this. One of them says, once and for all, clean your life. And the other one says, continue to move toward mature holiness or consecration or sanctification. Now, there is a real sense that when we were saved, we were both justified and sanctified. Now, the truth of the matter is, the moment you said yes to Jesus Christ, there was a cleansing that occurred. Matter of fact, when the Bible can speak of the church as being without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that is a reference to the complete cleaning that came to us in our position in Jesus Christ. So we are holy, if you please, because we're in Him. That's why we can be called saints, same root. But there is also a biblical emphasis that encourages us to move toward sanctification. Now, I really like another term because sanctification doesn't communicate well to me what it means. I like the term Christ-likeness. In my opinion, sanctification is Christ-likeness. And you know the beautiful passage in Ephesians chapter 4 about verse, I think it's about 13 where it says until we all attain to a unity of the faith, to the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. Now, I know that God has to do that. But my brothers and sisters, we must allow Him 
to work in our lives. And as we yield and open ourselves to Him, He will accomplish those tasks in us. Positionally, they are already accomplished. We are in Christ. We are justified. We are sanctified. But we're moving toward that in our daily lives. Now, I do not believe in sinlessness. But I do believe in sinning less. I don't believe in instant Christ-likeness. But I do believe that the longer we know Him, the more like Him we ought to become, our attitudes ought to become, our actions ought to become, and our priorities. There ought to be a movement to greater and greater faith. Now, the second thing that interests me about this, and you can't imagine the number of commentators that try to take this verse out of the Bible. Now, there is no manuscript anywhere where this verse is not in. But you know why they try to take it out? You see that little phrase that defiles our bodies and spirits? You see that right in the middle of 7-1? Now, usually, Paul, when he wants to talk about the two extremes in, in the human struggle, you read it in Romans 8, the flesh and the spirit. Uh, it's where godliness is in the spirit, but fallenness is in the flesh. And quite often, this is such an antithetical theological phrase in Paul that many are surprised that he would use them together here in a different sense. But what he's saying is, I think, our entire person. Now, to show you why I really think that this is, of course, Paul, and he uses it differently, I think I can prove it to you if you'll let me skip down to verse uh, 5 for just a moment. Now, notice in verse 5 where it says, My frail human nature could find no relief. Now, that is the same Greek word. It's the word sarx, and it simply means flesh, physical human flesh. Paul, the person Paul, was in such distress worrying about the church at Corinth that he couldn't get any rest. Now, remember I told you there is a huge parenthesis in 2 Corinthians. In chapter 3, verse 13, he starts to tell us about Titus' report. And then from 2.14 all the way through 7.4, is a, he gets so caught up <laughs> in the joy of what's happened, what Titus has told him, he forgets to tell us what Titus told him. And so he just has this huge afterthought or something. Now in verse 5, he's coming back to Titus' report. Do you see it in your Bible? Now, if you'll turn back quickly to chapter 2, verse 13, you will see that there is a synonymous phrase that talks about his spirit. Now, 2.13 and 7.5 are parallel. They, they're, they're saying the same thing, one introducing this parenthesis and one coming out of this parenthesis, and they're using flesh and spirit, sarks and pneuma, parallel. So I think... It is obvious that Paul can use those terms in non-theological ways to simply mean in the vernacular our entire person or our true self, something like that. And so I think that this is certainly Paul line. It's ridiculous to take it out because of something like that. Now, let's begin in verse 2. Make rooms for me in your heart. Do you remember, look on the next page, chapter 6, verse 11 through 13. Paul's been using a rather strange metaphor. He says, my heart is enlarged for you. Enlarge your hearts for me. Now, he's coming back to that. Make room for me in your hearts. For I have wronged Eris tents, nor harmed Eris tents, nor taken advantage of Eris tents, a single one of you. Now, there's two theories about this. Some say that the critics of Paul at this church were accusing him of doing these things. Others say that the false teachers were doing these things, and Paul's saying, I'm not acting like them. Now, I'm not real sure which it is, whether he's saying, I'm not acting like them, or it's untrue what I've been accused of. I'm not sure which it is, but you can tell the situation is very volatile at Corinth. Now, verse 3. I do not mean this for your condemnation, because I have said before to you, I have such a place in my heart. Now, look at your translation. I'm in verse 3. Bart's translation was accurate. My Williams is inaccurate. I'm going to read mine and you see what's different in yours. I would live with you or die. What's different? You probably have I would die with you or live, right? Die is first. Now, that's un we don't say that very often. I would die with you or live. Well, you say it the other way. I would live with you or I would die with you. 
why is it reversed? Well, I, honestly, I don't know why it's reversed. The only thing I can think of is, the first one's aorist, I would die once and for all for you. The second one is present, I would continue to live with you. It seems to me that Paul may be talking about baptism. Now, I know that there's nothing in the text that talks about water or anything, but remember in Romans 6, where the image of baptism is being buried to the old life and being raised to the new life. You go under the water of the old creature, you come up out of the water of the new creature. Well, that is the only way I can think where death precedes life. Um, Maybe Paul's referring back to chapter 5 where he talked about this, this tent that he wanted to take down and go and be with God, but he would, he would concede to stay and work with them and love them. It's either one of those two. I really don't know. For I have the greatest confidence. Or really, this, this Greek word means boldness or freedom to speak. In the face of all my sorrow, my cup is running over with joy. Isn't that something? He kind of get his heart in the heat. His, his attitude was not linked to circumstance. Oh, to God, Christian brother and sister, if we can ever get beyond the place where our happiness is linked to circumstance, we'll have the victory of the Christian life. So often, our contentment and peace is related to ha- what we're going through. And Paul says, In the midst of my sorrow, my cup is running over with joy. Now, verse 5, the parenthesis is over. We're coming back into Titus' report. For even after I had gotten to Macedonia, my frail human nature could find no relief. Perfect tense. Paul was worried sick. I'm so glad he was worried. (laughs) It helps me feel so much better when I worry about things that Paul, the apostle, was worried sick to death over an imaginary problem. Do you ever do that? I must must have caught it from Peggy because I never had it before I was married. But... um, (laughs) Do you ever do the what if, maybe, could be, only possibly game where you imagine in your mind what's going to happen before it ever happens and then you get all upset over what could happen and you've already fought the battle and it never happens? Do you ever do that? Paul did too. Does that help? Does it help that Paul did that too? I think, I think all of us are part of that. I was crushed, present, passive, participle. Boy, he was really in trouble with sorrow at every turn. Look at this next little phrase. Fighting without and fears within. Now, a famous preacher, he was so famous, they called him Golden Throat, which in Greek meant Chrysostom. That was his name, Golden Throat. <laughs> Old Golden Throat. And he said this referred to unbelievers within the church on the outside and Paul's fears on the inside. And now that sounds good, but really, the context doesn't fit that, does it? The context says he's just, he's just worried. He's worried about external things and internal things. It seems what it means to me. He's just really in a, in a tither over this, okay? Look at this beautiful... I love to find titles of God. One of my favorite titles for God is the God who is able. Oh, that'll preach, won't it? <laughs> the other one is the God of all comfort. Oh, what a beautiful title for God. It's in, the same word for comfort is in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians verses 3 through 5 where the word comfort's used about five or six times. It's used several times here. And remember the word comfort is the Greek word that's related to the word for Holy Spirit as, as paraclete, okay? One called alongside the comfort is, the, is what this term is. Now, comforts the downhearted, comforted me by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming but by the comfort he had gotten from you, because he kept on telling me how you were longing to see me, how sorrow... This is... This is I'm going to make... In just a minute, verses 8 through 10, I'm going to do the major study tonight is the word repentance with three words for sorrow. This word right here is a different Greek word. It means mourning. It's not really the words I'm going to be dealing with. It's the word mourning uh, you were. And how loyal you were to me so that I was gladder still. I'm not sure that's good grammar, but I understand what he's saying. Now, in verses 8 through 10, I want you to get your translations, and I need you to follow with me. If you have a pencil, I wish you would underline three words. Now, your translation is going to be different than mine, so I'm going to read mine real slow. There are three Greek words for sorrow, regret, and repentance. Now, it's real important that we understand the difference. Let Let me try to tell you why I think it's important. Judas was sorry that he betrayed the Lord. 
And he threw the money into the temple. He was sorry he betrayed the Lord. Esau was sorry he sold his birthright. Now, what's the difference in Esau and Judas? What's the difference in them and Peter and David? Now, they, Peter and David did equally atrocious things as Judas and Esau. What was the difference? Well, there's a Greek word that describes one and a Greek word that describes the other that is of major theological significance in this passage right here. Now, the first one, mine says, For although I did not cause you, do you have sorrow, grief? This is the general, neutral Greek term for sorrow or grief or pain. And it's going to be used about seven times in the next few verses. It's, it's neutral, but it's going to take on significance. By that letter. Now, we, either the lost letter or 1 Corinthians, we're not certain. We've talked about that before. I do not now regret it. Now, this regret it is exactly the word that's used of Judas Iscariot and Esau in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now, it's a word, it's metamelamai. It is the word for uh, after care. After care. Now, this, this, this deal. Some people don't steal because they're afraid they'll get caught. And if they get caught, they'll get put in jail for stealing. They have an after care about their actions. They are sorry because of the consequences of what they got into. Now, the next word down is after mind. And it is not sorry that you've been caught it's re it is sorrow that you did it, period. It is true repentance, okay? Regret. Although I did regret it, there's that, that different word twice. I see the letter caused you sorrow, there's that neutral term, for a time. For I am glad of it now. Not because you had such sorrow, neutral term, because your sorrow, neutral term, led you to... Now, here's the next big one. Do you have the word repentance? Repentance. This is the word after mind. Now, this is the word that's used uh, in Mark 1.15 that it takes repentance and faith to be saved. There is a negative aspect of salvation and a positive aspect. There is a turning from and a turning to. It is not primarily emotional, though emotions are involved. It is primarily volitional and it is the facing or the positioning of your lifestyle. When we are living for us and living in sin and living away from God, we are facing ourselves, what we want, what we desire, and the only issue in every decision is what's best for me. But as we turn from self and we orient our lives toward what God wants, what His will is, what's best for Him, what provides Him more glory, then we, that is what repentance is. It's a turning from and a turning to. This is faith. That is repentance. Now, that's the word here. Um, let's see, I was going to... It's a change of attitude followed by a change of action. Now, the Greek word for repentance primarily means a change of mind, after mind. But the Hebrew word for repentance means a change of action. They must be both be brought together for true biblical repentance. To simply to say, to meet Jesus involves a change. Now, if you have grown up in the church, and all of your life has been in the church, it is not going to be the radical, lightning kind of change of a man who's been off in sin for years and years. But the same thing will happen. It'll just be a different degree. Okay? Now, let me continue. For you took your sorrow, that's that neutral term, in accordance with the will of God, so that you should not suffer any loss at all from me. Now, what does that mean? Any loss at all from me? Well, I, I must admit, I don't know what it's talking about unless it's some kind of rewards. Now, I, I feel a little comfortable about rewards because I think anything good we do is because of the Holy Spirit in us and not us. And yet the Bible clearly over and over teaches that there are many rewards for the people of God. And so I guess what we're saying is that as we yield ourselves to the Spirit of God working in us, we receive a confirmation, a pat on the back, a reward from God who is so pleased we want His will in our lives. 
So you might want to put 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. That is the passage that talks about rewards based on lifestyle, okay? Let me continue then. Verse 10 now. For the sorrow, neutral term, but notice it's used in a special way. Sorrow that comes in accordance with the will of God results in repentance. This is godly repentance, true repentance, but that leads to salvation. Now, I want to give you three verses that deal with repentance. The missing element of most preaching is repentance. Let me give you three of them. Mark 1, 15, I already talked to you about. Luke 13, 5, Matthew 4, 17. Repentance and faith are the two irreducible minimums of biblical salvation. Okay, that leads to salvation, that leaves no regret. Now, there's that term, metamelami, the regret of Judas and Esau. Let me tell you, show you what that is. Judas, the same word is used for him in Matthew 27, 3, and the same word is used for Esau in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 16 and 17. So it's a sorrow, but it's not a repentance. There's an emotional element, but not a turning from and a turning to. Okay? For, well, excuse me, no regrets, but the sorrow, there's that neutral term, but look like it's used this way. The world produces resulted in death. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you can, you can cry and cry and cry and cry and cry over your sin. And you can even try to re, re, uh, redo or reform or uh, give back or make amends. But if you don't turn to God in faith, it's not biblical repentance. You see, sorrow is not the key element. It is the positioning of our life to self or to God. There is a sorrow in the world. Have you ever seen a murderer who's about to die cry? I think I would cry too. There is a sorrow that the consequences of my act have led to this. But that is not necessarily salvation. Salvation is possible when we focus away from ourselves, away from what we want, and we begin to focus toward God and what He wants. And there's, these words are very significant. Now, when Jerome translated the Latin Vulgate over around 300 years after Christ, 400 years, something like that, he changed the word after Mind, which is the true word for repentance. Do you know what he changed it to in the text? Do penance. Now, do you hear the difference? Do penance is totally different from re repent. For we, can, we often rationalize, now, I've, I've sold this and so I'll give back more. That is not what makes things right, giving back more. Repentance is not the key. Repentance is the key and will often involve penance, which means either trying to help the person you hurt, uh, repay what you stole. Uh, if whatever it is, you're going to try to make up for it. Not that you'd be forgiven by making up, but because your heart's been changed, you're going to love the person you hurt and you're going to try to make it right. Now, the world may try to make it right, but leaves out the relationship with God. Okay? Verse 11. For see what this very sorrow, neutral term, but look how it's, it's colored, suffered in accordance with the will of God has done for you. How earnest it has made you. How con concerned to clear yourselves. How indignant. How alarmed. How much it made you long to see me. How loyal to me. How determined. Look at this word. To punish the offender. Now, this is the word vengeance, but it means to mete out justice. Well, what, what, what is he talking about? At every point you have cleared yourself in this matter. What, what point? Well, there's only two things I can imagine. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the man who was caught in an incestuous relationship with his father's wife? Now, it's either that... Or it's, the, it's these false teachers who had been active in the church and had stirred things up and the church had dealt with them. Which it is, I do not know. Now in verse 12, 
It seems like he's saying, I didn't do it for this, and I didn't do it for this, but I did it for this. But this is a Hebrew idiom of comparison. We're not negating the first two statements. We're just saying the third statement is the real priority. The, other t- the first two statements are very important if you read them. Paul's not saying, I just wipe those out, that they have nothing to do. He's saying the third statement is the true priority motive of why I've done what I've done. Now, look, it says in verse 13, the gladness of Titus. I bet Titus was tickled because Timothy went to that church and got waylaid by him. (laughs) And I bet Titus was not excited at all about going to that church. He kept saying, now, Paul, is there any other assignment? No, Titus, I want you to go to Corinth. But Titus came back so, so happy. The church responded to him, and he, he felt a real joy there. Now, verse 14 is a first class conditional if. If I've been doing some boasting of you to him, I've never been ashamed of it. Isn't it great that Paul bragged on this church who gave him the most trouble? Oh, I tell you, what a heart. Uh, Verse 15. Yes, his heart is running over toward you as he continues to recall. Present middle participle. He's he's going over and over and over and over with Paul what happened. How you have all obeyed him. I want to give you three verses that talk about obedience to Christian leaders. And I want you to write them down because we don't talk about them much. 1 Corinthians 16, 16, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, and Hebrews 13, 17. With what reverence and trembling you welcomed him. Welcomed him as an official representative of Paul, of course, who is the apostle. And I am glad that I have perfect confidence in you now. Well, what Paul's saying is, oh, we made up. <laughs> Everything's okay. This is the end of the fight. You know, he's not, he's not worried anymore. He's not fretful anymore. He left a full-blown, God-sent revival in Ephesus because he was so worried about Corinth. And now he's heard that Corinth is okay, and he's going to pick up from here. Now, next time, we're going to pick up on chapters 8 and 9. And I want to encourage you right now to read 8 and 9 as a unit. We'll take them separately. But I believe 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is the definitive passage in the whole New Testament on guidelines for spiritual giving. And I hope you'll outline them in your own words as we come together next week.